Welcome back to Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix, and joining me today is Kevin Wadsworth, a.k.a. Northstar on Twitter and Gold Tent. Kevin has a background in meteorology, and he's been doing that for the last 30 years. He draws lots of comparisons to the world of trading, and he credits the book The Fourth Turning for bringing his interests into the world of the of the financial markets. How are you today, Kevin? Oh, I'm very good, Tom. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me on. Great, great to have you. Could you tell us a little bit about a little bit more about how you got into the the world of trading? Uh, yeah, sure, no problem. I, I kind of got an interest, I would say, around about the early 2000s, and uh, it was through a, a friend of mine, colleague at work, who who had an interest in finances and uh, the global economy, and we used to chat about it. And um, of course, the financial crisis started to develop. Um, 2006, 2007, and of course into the the big crash in 2008, and that really got my interest going, and I started looking at um, investments and where to put my savings, and um, so yeah, started studying the markets and developing some sort of techniques of, of my own. I, I had a little read of uh, Strauss and Howe's Fourth Turning. It wasn't the the, the full book, but a sort of an executive summary, and that really uh, got my interest going. And it seemed to draw a lot of parallels with um, with the world of weather forecasting. And I kind of took it from there, really. Excellent. So you're mostly a, a technical analyst. So why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the technical indicators that you use? Some sometimes you uh, post the charts with MACD, Trix, RSI, Stoke indicators on it. So maybe go through a couple of those and tell us what the importance is of those. Yeah, sure. So again, my my approach with all of this is to kind of um, make things as simple as possible. And I mean, the MACD, for example, is a stands for Moving Average Convergence Divergence. And it's basically a, a trend following a momentum indicator. It kind of shows the, the relationship between moving averages of whatever it is that you happen to be to be looking at. Um, I use, tend to use MACD, Trix and Stochastic, and they're just the three that I favor. The Trix is a triple exponential um, average, and it's, it's kind of an oscillator. It's... Um, showing you whether a market is overbought or oversold and it's kind of used as a i suppose some that sort of a momentum indicator and it tells you um something about the the moment the momentum and the price direction of, of a particular stock uh, and the stochastic uh, oscillator it's a uh, another one of the, the the three that i tend to use and it's um it's, it's kind of a, a momentum indicator again um in particular sort of to do with closing price of of a of a security uh, and it kind of compares a, to a sort of range of prices over time but this kind of sounds kind of confusing to to most people who aren't sort of familiar with these kind of um statistical analyses but you can really just take a, a step back from all of that and look at these lines on the chart and set them up underneath, for example, a gold chart. And all you have to do is kind of look at these indicators and compare how they move to the, how the price of the uh, market that you're, you're looking at is moving. So in, in the case of gold, pull up a gold chart, put the MACD stochastic and tricks on there and just spend a bit of time, or I did anyway, spend a bit of time studying the relationship between between all of those lines and what the indicators do and and when they do that what does it what effect does it have on the price so in the example of um i don't know let's say the the macd for example it's basically two squiggly lines on a chart but when one of them crosses over the other one it becomes bullish and the price action becomes bullish so you get a buy effectively a buy signal when the lines make a bullish cross and from that point onwards until they make a bearish cross the price of gold or whatever you're following um rises you get a bearish cross the lines cross over each other again and the price begins to fall back as long as the indicator stays above the zero line you should remain within a bull market if it drops below the zero drops below the zero line then it's more serious and you're developing perhaps more likely to be developing into a bear market but again another factor in all of this is what time frame you're looking at because if you're looking at time frames of days or weeks, then these um, price movements tend to be um, short-lived. If you zoom out and set your um, 
uh, your, your time view on, for example, um, trading view, if you're using that to look at your price chart, set it for the five year or the all time um, sort of views, then you get a much bigger picture view and you're kind of better informed as to whether you're in an overall bull market or an overall bear market. So as we're speaking about lengths of time to look at markets, you were we were discussing before the call a 16 year cycle in the gold market and where we could see that the eight year possible correction. Where are we in that cycle? And explain to us a little bit about why that gold or the gold market historically has followed that 16 and eight year cycle. The, re- the reasons for cycles in anything are human behavior. Uh, it's humans that will um, trade the markets. So all of the cycles that we see in gold, silver, US dollar, you know, whatever it happens to be, the, um, the stock markets, they're, they're there to begin with because of human trading behavior. It's, it's the humans that and, and the algorithms that we write that trade the stocks and move the prices up, down and sideways. So all of that price movement is a, a, a human um, manifestation of the economic cycle and the economic cycle itself um, follows a, a pattern and a cycle as well. With the, in, in the specific case of the gold market, we saw um, a 16 year cycle low uh, back in uh, around about the year 2000, 1999, 2000, 2001, that sort of general time period. Um, and then gold rose steadily for eight years, seven, eight years, and suffered a sharp pullback into the uh, financial crisis low in 2008. And then we had another three years from 2008 to 2011, where we reached the peak in uh, 2011. And at that point, we'd reached the peak of that uh, sort of 16-year cycle. And then we saw the price falling all the way back down until we reached a low late in late uh, 2015, early 2016. So from low to low, that's 2000 to 2016. That's approximately uh, 16 years. So that's the 16-year cycle with that pullback in 2008. And that's the eight-year cycle pullback. So we're now, um, if we take the low at uh, early 2016, we're now sort of four years into the next cycle. So we've been rising since uh, 2016 steadily. Um, and we're now up to around about uh, 17.30 or thereabouts. Goals around, goals around about 17.30 now. Uh, and the next sort of low that I'm expecting um, will be that eight-year cycle low. So, of course, eight years from 2016 is 2024. So we should hit a low point in either late 2023 or early 2024. And, of course, the question for investors is, at what point do we start to see price dropping so that it uh, falls into that low? Um, and that's another question, of course, which we'll be following very closely with the uh, with the charts that uh, that, I, that I post. Absolutely. So all that is spelled out very, very clearly on the gold chart that we'll have up on the screen. Uh, is there anything else that we need to be looking at on that particular chart? Yeah, so I've got a couple of the indicators on there. There's a stochastic indicator and a triple exponential tricks indicator. And um, the number of things that you can do with these um, indicators, and one of them is to see just how stretched we are, how how extreme the indicators are at any point in time. Because when you reach an extreme, it doesn't tend to stay there for too long. Things reach an extreme and then... Um, of course, sort of gravity takes over and they reset and uh, and you're back to square one again. So um, with a stochastic indicator, we're not quite yet at the um, sort of peak that you might expect in a in a good bull market. If you look back in time on the stochastic indicator through the um, through the early 2000s and through sort of 2005, 6, 7 through 2010, 11, the, um, the indicator reached a, a slightly higher level than we're at at the moment. So the scope there. So that's one piece of evidence that we may not yet uh, have reached the sort of peak that I'm, ex- I'm expecting before we see a, a much more sort of significant pullback. Um, another thing that you can do, I've got the triple exponential, the tricks indicator on there, and you can use it to look back historically on that particular indicator to see where, when was the last time we were at this sort of level. And um, there are two two places uh, on the on the chart in the last sort of 20 years or so where the tricks indicator has been at this sort of level once was on the way up in around about 2003 and the other time of course was on the way down in around about 2013 late 2013 um, so comparably 
the indicators rising at the moment. You need to go back to 2003, and that was um, towards the start of the last uh, big bull market run. So that's another piece of evidence that we are just in the early stages at the moment of a de- developing um, precious metals bull market. And it's all about gathering gathering evidence for and against. I'm not a bull or a, or a bear. Um, I'm not sort of optimistic or pessimistic as far as any particular market's concerned. I'm just following the evidence, and uh, the evidence at the moment suggests that um, – there is a, a higher likelihood that gold will be go up, going up than than it will be going down. Um, of course, you know people that are expecting gold to fall significantly, I would never say that's not possible. Um, anything's possible. It's more about what's probable, uh, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. Interesting. So one of the uh, defining features that we're going to see on on this chart and also the next two charts we're going to look at is this kind of arcing pattern. Could you explain to us a little bit about how you started to kind of recognize that pattern in your trading? Yeah, so also on the gold chart, I've I've marked a multi-year base. And um, there's a tool on most of the sort of chart chart analysis websites that that allows you to, to draw an arc effectively. And it does it geometrically perfectly so that arc that i've got on there using trading view software is is geometrically perfect and i I just kind of noticed just visually again going back to my sort of training as a weather forecast and being able to sort of pick out chart patterns and and chart formations i noticed that a lot of these arcs were were sort of evident on on the price action of all sorts of charts Um, and it helps because once you've identified a developing arc, you can start to verify whether it's whether it's genuine or not. In the case of gold, there was a an arc pattern that that sort of formed in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, and and that's what you know sort of supported the price action as it came out of the low in sort of 1999, 2000, 2001. And it also you can also draw a, a much a sharper geometric arc in the 2008 um, cyclical low as well. And this multi-year base, which has been developing ever since the sort of drop out of the 2011 high, um, is interesting because it's such a long and slow process. It's, I mean, it's taken, if you draw the full arc, it goes all the way back to 2011. So we're sort of a decade of building out this base. And I think... Um, most listeners have probably sort of come across the saying from from investors that the bigger the base, the big the bigger the sort of price rise. You know, if something takes a long time to form a a strong solid base, then the likelihood is that the energy and the momentum carrying price out of that base will will take it much higher than most investors would expect. So it's, this is going to be you know really interesting in in years going forward now to see just how how high gold is going to go out of this enormous multi-year base and um, as the price rises up on the right hand side of the arc the price should touch the side of the arc at least twice um, usually I don't know three or four times and that's confirming that the arc is valid just as it did on the way down it confirms the arc is valid and as you're drawing as you're actually drawing it in real time you can extend the arc to the right um, and sort of adjust the shape of the arc and you, you don't actually know until until the price hits the support of the arc just where to draw that line all you do know is that the arc is in the process of forming it's interesting stuff and and you know it's, it's another tool you can, it's not you can't just use it in isolation but you, it's another tool that you can use to give you more confidence that what you think is happening is is actually happening so it, it, it's added a, a lot of confidence to my sort of analysis over the, over the last few years and um, having recognized the cyclical low in 2016 it's another um, it's another piece of the evidence that suggests that we're we're setting up for a multi-year uh, bull market now. So when we're looking at those arcs, Kevin, are we kind of looking at a a longer timeline, or can we apply that to a, a little bit of a shorter timeline? You can apply it on shorter time frames. You can zoom in and look at price action over a period of weeks, and sometimes the um, the price action does form these little arcs. For some reason, I do find they work better over over longer time periods. I think the the shorter the time period that you have, the more prone the price action is to kind of morphing into a, into something completely different. So you start out with something that you think is a 
a developing arc and suddenly price drops way below the, the support of the arc and it actually turns out that what you're forming is, I don't know, some kind of megaphone pattern, for example, where you end up with a, a kind of a bull flag megaphone on a, you know, you sort of measure the, 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 the price rise from the bottom of the flagpole to the top of the flagpole and you have a, a sort of a, um, a, a bull flag of, of some description which ends up forming. And on the shorter time frames, it's much harder to assess what the pattern is that's going to prevail. Um, but what I find is that if you look at the time frames on, on, a, on a longer sort of, um, a longer time scale of, of sort of months, um, it, it gives you confidence that it will resolve in an upwards direction. That's what you really need to know as a trader: is is it going to is this pattern going to resolve up or is it going to resolve down? And you need to, you need to start looking at um, support and resistance levels to to make that sort of analysis. Um, if the price breaks the support level, then you make a decision as an investor: you're either going to get out of the out of the trade, um, stand back for a little while and see what develops, or you you stay in if you're a longer term trader and you're confident that the overall uh, market is going to resolve in an upward direction because <laughs> believe you me like like most of us i think i've made the wrong decision a few times and jumped out um just as the price is falling and then you get a sudden reversal and um you're, ch you're chasing the um the price to try and jump back jump back in again so it's very often sit tight be right and just you know comfortable in the knowledge that we're in a long-term bull market so unless you really know what you're doing um i find it best to to not jump out and back in again too often that would be my uh, my advice to to um to, to new investors really as you're playing that saying not to jump in and out do you ever set a a trailing stop or anything any tool like that to kind of follow the price or as you're saying just kind of be right and sit tight that depends a lot on how much time you have to monitor your stock prices and how many stocks you have. If you've just got half a dozen stocks and you um, have plenty of time, then you can check them individually, you know, on a on a daily basis. It's not a problem. But if you've got a, a portfolio of you know 30, 40, 50 stocks and um, <laughs> you've, you've got a full time job, then it, it probably does make a lot of sense to put sell stocks in there so that you um, you know you you automatically out of the market as soon as one of your sell stops is hit so i, I tend to because because i'm confident that the, the, you know we're in a pm bull market and we have been since i sort of got more heavily invested around about sort of 2000 and well i suppose it's around about 15 thereabouts um then i i i'm more sit tight and be right but it's, it's very much a personal decision how much time you can devote to managing your your own portfolio um, and again, you know, it makes it, it makes sense not to invest more than you can <clears throat> sort of afford to lose in a way. You know, if you're playing the stock market as a as a novice, then you know you, you need to exercise a lot of caution um, and and you know take your advice and information from a variety of sources. Interesting. So, when you personally are looking at obviously gold, do you believe that playing the miners? would be a more leveraged way of trying to, let's say, capitalize on a little bit more profit in that sector? Yeah, certainly the case that as gold, the gold bull market develops, then the miners um, do leverage your, your gains. You see greater percentage gains historically if you're invested in um, individual miners as opposed to being invested in the metal. But then conversely, of course, when price pulls back, then you get a, a larger percentage decline, which can be quite scary to some investors. So if you're uh, invested in miners, then you need to be prepared to sort of ride out the storm and um, not sort of hit the sell button at the first the first sign of trouble. So Again, it's the case of weighing up your own sort of risk tolerance. Um, my approach is to be um, invested in the metal itself and also to be invested in the miners. And the miners themselves come in a variety of forms as well, some some more volatile than others. So the large cap producers, the likes of Barrick, uh, Yamana, Newmont, Kirkland, those sort of names, um, they're sort of investment grade gold miners. They tend to be sort of quite heavily bought by by commercial investors, uh, portfolio managers, that kind of thing. Whereas the more junior uh, miners and the explorers, uh, much more volatile, and they they come into play sort of during the more the more sort of mature stages of the bull market when the man on the street starts to sort of see the, the the rapid price rises and start investing in some of these juniors. Which, to be fair, you know they only need a a relatively small number of people going out sort of 
putting their hard-earned money into the into the shares and some of the share prices sort of rocket by 100 percent 200 percent sort of you know crazy crazy amounts so it's risk tolerance and it's timing things right at, at this stage in the bull market i've been invested in um, the large cap uh, producers the more investment grade names that you find in for example the hui and gdx uh, indices but i think time is approaching where we're going to see bigger gains with some of the smaller uh, gdxj type type companies each each man to his own really whatever whatever each individual investor prefers it wouldn't be for me to to sort of uh, tell tell people which is which is a particular way to to go it's uh, it, it's it's very much a personal decision and you, you know it's a case of being aware of the the, the risks so moving on to our silver chart you've got a target area around f- fairly near term target of 20 to 21 dollars explain to us a little bit about how you s- see that market developing as well yeah, that's an interesting one as well. The silver market has been lagging enormously and in fact made a, uh, a bear market low during the, call it March madness, if you like, when the news about COVID-19 started to break and we saw um, silver price dropping uh, below, below the lows that it made in 2015, 2016. It's very rapidly sort of bounced back and um, got back inside the the arc, which I have uh, silver trading in. Um, so I tend to view that as, as a not... Uh, an anomaly uh, rather than sort of um, a true sort of reflection of the market itself so we can kind of i think so, uh, sort of discount that an, as as an uh, you know a, a knee jerk anomaly and a crazy sort of reaction so the silver price is back up at uh, around about 1750 or thereabouts and uh, so it's a case of looking at support and resistance levels we've got the arc supporting price below us the geometric arc which you can see on the chart there and we've got some resistance levels there are many more support and res- resistance levels than the ones that i've uh, drawn on here when you look at look at a, uh, a chart that's um, looking at a long time period you can put in some some long-term uh, support and resistance levels and if you zoom in and look at the price action over the last uh, few weeks or few months then you can put it uh, some support and resistance levels at, um, at much shorter time frames but um, the big one really is um, up above us at around about 20 21 dollars and I, I often view these as resistance zones rather than uh, a very sharp resistance line i know a lot of people uh, a lot of um, technical traders will draw a pencil thin line view that as a as a sort of a you know a line that you can or cannot cross but if you sort of examine it in a little bit more detail there's a lot of price action going on within a particular zone price being rejected both on the way down and on the way up and it kind of gives a what i sometimes refer to as a turbulence zone and this goes back a bit to my days of of weather forecasting at RAF stations uh, in the UK here um, uh, providing uh, turbulence forecasts for the pilots and it's like a a level in the atmosphere as you go up through the through the clouds and you hit a turbulence zone and um, so it's it's kind of a turbulence zone up around 20 21 dollars and the price action is going to struggle a little bit we'll probably see rejection a couple of times there and then eventually price punching through and coming out of that turbulence zone going up above the clouds and um, marching up towards the uh, the mid to upper 20s where we can uh, start to identify further support and resistance particularly around about 28 to 30 dollars i think um, is is a fairly clear horizontal resistance level Um, and there's also that inclining rising uh, resistance level which is currently well i suppose it's somewhere around about 35 40 dollars just looking at it on the chart there but also the indicators stochastic and the tricks indicators there in particular interest is the uh, is the tricks indicator it doesn't very often move above and below zero Um, in fact the last time it moved up through zero was 2004 so again that's another piece of evidence that we're in a comparable time period to to i think i said on the gold chart i said 2003 and uh, on the silver chart it looks like 2004 so whichever way you you kind of look at it we're we're historically um seeing the indicators doing similar very similar things to what they were doing 2003 and 2004 with the tricks indicator on silver just about to make a a very positive and bullish move above the zero line and uh, you can see what happened last time that occurred it set us up for uh, a very long-term bull market in silver which saw us moving from below six dollars all the way up to uh, way above thirty dollars so um, some interesting times ahead that's for sure you can you can say that again let's move on to the dollar chart u.s dollar chart uh the title on it is the u.s dollar doomed uh so let's <laughs> let's uh let's talk about how 
it we could see the dollar slide further. Yeah, you have to forgive my uh, my play on words there. That's the that's the <laughs> English humour, but uh, um, yeah, it, 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 again, I've, I've been messing around with these arcs and also noticed that sometimes it's not just the base that forms and uh, kind of complies with. The, the the resistance and support levels that you get from a geometric arc it's you know you, you get a, a basing situation where price is bottoming out but from time to time you also get it um in a topping formation and I, just to make things clear i'm not what i'm not saying here is that i'm not saying the dollar is not going to break out and it's not going to go to 110 120 130 i've got an open mind and the arguments for and against the dollar uh, dropping and for and against the dollar rising are, you know, they're, they're good arguments on 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 both sides. You know, with what's happening with with uh, the US dollar and its um, supply and demand fundamental fundamentals around the world, um, I can I can understand the arguments on both sides. But from a purely technical point of view, the um, the the arc formation that you see there, it is what it is. You know, it 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 is containing the price action on the dollar. Uh, we did see a bearish rising wedge as you can see on the black the black sort of uh, triangle there if you want to call it that um bearish rising wedge price dropped dropped out of that and has has not um has not moved up since and it's it's failed to break through on a, on a monthly closing basis it's failed to break through the through the arc um and you can see the stochastic indicator there not looking particularly supportive so the jury's out in in my mind the jury's out with the dollar it tried to make a break for for uh, over 100, it, it sort of went to 103 or thereabouts, then very quickly fell back inside again, um, and has been struggling ever since. So you can look at the US dollar over a, a bigger time period, and you can see that there's actually been three of these uh, sort of cyclical peaks in the US dollar. Um, one was in the mid 1980s, uh, the next was uh, around about 2000, 2001, and of course the one that we're in now. So we've had sort of every 15 years or so we've we've seen these peaks um in the in the US dollar and corresponding troughs and there's a very repetitive pattern you can't sort of get away from the fact there's a very repetitive pattern in the US dollar behavior since the Bretton Woods agreement was um disbanded or dispelled or collapsed in uh, in the early 1970s the uh, US dollar or the US came off the gold standard and the first cycle for the US dollar was very violent. It sort of sh shot the, um, the the dollar index from the mid 80, sort of around about 85 or so, all the way up to 160, 165. So the you know the dollar index rocketed up in a very short space of time, and then just as quickly uh, collapsed. So that it fell from from above 160 to um, you know sort of 80 or below within the space of a few years. So. Uh, and then it rebounded again, back up to 120, and then back down again. And each one of the um, sort of troughs, each one of the low points, is lower than the previous one as well. Um, so the uh, the low point in the 1980s was around about uh, 83 or so on the dollar index. In the um, early 1990s, it fell back to somewhere around about 76, 77. And in uh, sort of 2008 or thereabouts, it fell to around about 71. So we've got an ever declining trough in the dollar index. The negative sort of side to all of this from a technical point of view is that we only have two complete cycles to look at. Um, so the evidence is limited. So caution, you do need to exercise caution if you don't have you know, a, a very, very long period of time to look back on. It's like trying to forecast the weather with only um, a small amount of sort of climatology to refer to. Um, you, you need to know the climatology of a location going back hundreds of years to be able to set the context for, for the daily weather forecast and what kind of extremes you might expect to experience. So again, there's an, there's an analogy there with, with weather forecasting that, that I draw on. So um, very much, very much the jury's out on the US dollar, but I, I, I do sort of enjoy pulling that chart up every now and again and just tracking it. Excellent. So let's let's move on to uranium broadly. And we have a, a chart here f uh, from you for energy fuels. Just looking at that, could we kind of overlay the uranium spot price and over over the energy fuels chart and kind of see a, a convergence? Yeah, so this is an interesting one, isn't it, with uranium? It's a, a very, very volatile market and uranium spot prices have been 
benefiting of of late. Um, although, again, the, this is another market where the jury is out a little bit. I've noticed, in fact, that there's, a, again, a cyclical nature to the uranium market, and um, it tends to be uh, later in the year where you get more positive price action. So it does tend to be after the summer into the early autumn, as we call it over here, the early early sort of fall uh, period where um, the uranium miners and uranium spot prices tend to tend to sort of pick up more reliably. So it wouldn't surprise me if we had sort of uh, some summer doldrums here, but that um, falling wedge on the energy fuels price chart using the log scale there, again, it interests me greatly because of the, <laughs> you just need to look at the, the scale on the chart to sort of appreciate just how much the uh, stock prices have fallen in the uranium sector. And bearing in mind that around the world, there's a big sort of focus on clean energy at the moment. And post Fukushima, of course, the uranium miners suffered very, very badly. And there were huge losses right across the sector. And I think that's reset the sentiment. And, you know, what you really want to be doing as an investor is buying when the price is low and selling when the price is high. And on that basis, um, you can't really do any better than look at the uranium market at the moment, because, I mean, goodness me, the price has fallen from uh, (laughs) $200 or more um, down to where are we now? About $2. Um, So, that, you know, I, I realise there have been other things that have gone on in the intervening sort of time periods with individual uh, mining with, um, I don't know, reverse splits and all sorts of things being done with the shares. So that there are things that you need to look at with individual companies to sort of take into account just why the, the sort of the, the mining prices might have fallen quite as far as they have. But that all being said, the value in the uh, the sector seems uh, very attractive at the moment. It does seem to me that uh, there's no fundamental reason why we shouldn't see the uh, prices recovering uh, quite substantially. And that falling wedge is um, quite something. If we see a price break out of there, then uh, the upward price targets are uh, going to be very attractive to investors. I know we were going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin and, and how you've seen that's actually those charts are actually able to have, let's say, traditional technical analysis applied to them. So tell us a little bit more about Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. So cryptocurrencies are another sort of sector that I that I follow, and mainly because well, a couple of reasons really. One is that you know it, it does seem to me that um, you know the way we pay for our goods these days is um, very much being digitised. How that pans out over the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years obviously remains to be seen. But Bitcoin been forefront of, of this sort of march in new technology and there are many 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 other um, cryptocurrencies ethereum litecoin and um, many many others as, as i say but um, the chart price action t- seems to be very much again sort of following the rules that um, that all of the other markets follow so in the case of bitcoin you can uh, notice a multi-year base forming uh, since 2017 where we peaked at uh, over $18,000. Price has fallen back, creating the left-hand side of a geometric arc. And we've now uh, started to see the possible, you know, the likelihood of the right-hand side of the arc starting to be um, to be verified. Um, even if you don't look at that, that arc, you can draw a, a wedge formation, a bullish wedge formation with an upper resistance line and a lower support level Uh, connecting the price action and price at the moment is just interacting with that upper uh, resistance line so um, a a clear move above uh, I suppose around about $9,800 to $10,000 a clear move above that will be a very very significant breakout in in the uh, Bitcoin market I I'm very much um, waiting to see, you know, <laughs> where this goes. I, I, I sort of got invested again around about $7,000 as the uh, price action sort of hit what I thought would be the right-hand side of the arc. And we've seen a good sort of price rise since then. I've stayed in, invested in, in Bitcoin um, with its price sort of oscillating around about $9,500 over, over recent sort of weeks. Tempted at times to uh, to take profits, but... Um, my position size is, is, you know, not particularly large. So, I, you know, the risk isn't particularly high. So I, I think I'm going to sit this one out and see how it goes. But the stochastic indicator on the long term chart is is looking quite bullish. So short term time frames does look as though we may see some pullback. But I think uh, looking at the longer term chart, pullback to around about $8,000 would be healthy. 
anything below that, I'd be a little bit more concerned. But um, all of these markets, you know, Litecoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin, gold, silver, US dollar, they all follow the same chart rules, you know, the support resistance uh, rules, the rules that um, sort of go with um, the cyclical nature of the markets and also the rules that go with bullish and bearish rising and falling wedges and megaphones and and bear flags and bull flags and all those sorts of things that you can sort of read about and and learn about. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm pretty much self-taught with all of this and applying some of my uh, sort of weather forecasting techniques and statistical analysis tools, if I can even say the word. And and my sort of aim in all of this is really to try and simplify what can be quite um, quite a confusing chart to look at and try and sort of zone out all of the all of the noise, all of the um, confusing stuff, and just sort of focus really on what matters. Focus on the fundamentals. Focus on the the you know the clear lines of support and resistance, and um, the sort of um, the indicators that are particularly uh, interesting at any point in time, the indicators which are giving us clear signs as to where where we may be going in the future, a bit like producing a weather forecast, really. Lots of excellent info. I think that's a a great place to kind of wrap up, Kevin. Why don't you let us know where we can find uh, more information about you? Yeah, sure. So you can uh, you can find me on on Twitter, um, Northstar. So it's uh, at North, N-O-R-T-H-S-T-1-8-3-6-3. Three three seven. So that's me on Twitter, and uh, using the same handle, the same pseudonym, you can find me as Northstar on uh, on Gold Tent, as it's called, or GoldTades.com, Gold T A D I S E dot com. Perfect, and we'll have those links in the show notes. Kevin, thanks for your time today. Thank you very much, Tom. Good talking. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people? Hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, It could be a rip-your-face-off uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?